Welcome into Mean Green Game Day. I'm your host, Sarah Baskin. Alongside me tonight are Jack Brown, Justin Ballou, and Connor Hibbett. Fellas, how are we feeling this evening? Great. That was an awesome win. Man, I'm, it's kind of surreal. It is. It's completely surreal, and I know we're all having a great time. UNT, first NCAA tournament win in school history, upsetting Purdue 78 to 69. It's a fantastic evening. I know I was sweating the entire night, and we did it as only UNT can do it, it seems, in overtime. Justin, what are your initial thoughts tonight? Well, I thought it was another game where it all started with our defense. And I thought in the first half specifically, we really set the tone and the pace of that game with our defense. We handled everything that Purdue was throwing at us in that first half and pretty much with ease. We, we only allowed 24 first half points against Purdue and that was, that was one of their lowest first half totals of the entire season. And it all started with guarding Travian Williams and Zach Eady. Those were the two guys last, last show that we said that we were gonna have to, to match up to their size because those guys were, were really big and, and all season long it was Travian Williams that was their leading scorer. Thomas Bell did an outstanding job against Travian Williams that entire game. And sometimes he needed the help of Zach Simmons on the double teams and sometimes he did and he, they held Travian Williams to two points in that first half, and, and I thought that really set the tone of, for, the re for the rest of that game. What do you think, Connor? The whole entire game was just kind of surreal because you grow up watching all these games in March Madness, and you see some of these 13 and 14 seeds win, and you're like, my gosh, obviously it must feel great for the players, the coaching staff, but what must it feel like for the student body? And for me as a UNT student, it's just an incredible, surreal moment because when you finally hear that final buzzer sound, you see UNT moving on to the next round, it's like, did this really just happen? And obviously, like Justin said, it started with the defense, and that's been UNT all season, and of course it had to go to overtime. But it, it was just a, a total surreal moment and something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. I 100% agree. It was one of those moments where you just you can't believe that you get to be a, you get to be a student you get to be a fan i know a lot of us are like dallas cowboys fans they let us down every time and it's just felt really good to have a team that wasn't letting us down now i had full confidence and put them in my bracket i actually actually had them going to the sweet 16. jack were you surprised at all yeah i was totally surprised it, it, it was really cool to see how they defended Edie and williams it, it really made me think that we can defend any big man you know they're the tallest team in the big 10. but it's just funny to see everybody come out of the cracks and crevices that were like not fans, but now they are fans. So it's just funny to see everybody, oh yeah, go me green, all of a sudden, so. Personally, I, um, I welcome bandwagon fans. It's like, wel welcome along to the team. Welcome to the bandwagon. We like having you here. Connor, do you disagree on that one? Uh, depending on the degree of how good a team is. So if you're jumping on the bandwagon for Gonzaga or Baylor, it's like, well, of course, you're just gonna hop on the number one team. But it's different when you do it for an underdog because it feels like no matter who they go up against, it's always gonna be like, well, let's just pull for the underdog. You got, you got nothing to lose. And so it's different when you, like it's a UNT versus a Baylor. So obviously I'm for it. And UNT is so fun to root for. So I would argue all aboard the bandwagon. Let's go. Let's take all the fans that, that want to root for us. I agree. Now, so we mentioned a little bit about Zach Simmons and how he, he, he and Thomas Bell were able to really guard up on Edie. Who else impressed you during the game? Well, on offense, it was really a group effort. It all started with Davian Hamlet. He had 24 points and 12 boards, a double-double from him, uh, something that we don't always see. But he, he's always the leading scorer in points. Everything on offense starts with him driving to the lane, and that's exactly as it was in this game. But, but the thing that I think was so impressive with the offense was that there was that movement ar around Javian Hamlet that I talked about th there needing to be. You know, we had guys like Jerez McBride, who once again had a really nice shooting game. He was four of six from downtown, contributed 16 points. Thomas Bell, 16 points of his own. He's the one that got the offensive kicks, offensive, uh, the offense kickstarted in the first half, first seven points of the game. He had some clutch shots in overtime as well. So it was a, it was a group effort, and that's how UNT wins games when when everybody contributes on offense. So it was nice to see. I'm gonna have to agree with you 100% on Rodriguez McBride. It's been so fun just literally watching his three point percentage go up and up and up throughout the CUSA tournament and obviously last game. Just literally watching his percentage inch up, inch up more and more. But Jack, who did who did you like? Uh, I kind of just liked, I, I'm not going to pick a specific player, I'm going to pick the three-point shooting. You know, when you play a team that big, the three ball becomes really important, and when you shoot 40% from three, it's going to be hard to lose. So I think everybody stepped up with the three ball. It was super impressive to see that. And speaking of the three ball, how, how about how UNT's defense made Purdue shoot the three? I mean, they only averaged 20 attempts each game coming into the, coming into the UNT game. They shot 30 against us. So that, that's just a testament to how good that inside defense was with, with Thomas Bell and, and Zach Simmons in that game because there was nothing inside. They had to force it to the outside and, and had the guards take the shots. I think if we did a little bit more offensive uh, 
just presence from Zach Simmons, you're going to be golden for UNT. You just need him to, to score a little bit more buckets. I, saving up all this offense for, for, the, for the tournament for March mm -hmm. Madness. They were waiting all season. They were just kind of playing around with everyone. Like, you just wait. Once we get to the tournament, we're going to start turning it on. They, they just didn't want to show people what they really had. They, they want to come out as a kind of like the uh, thing of surprise. They're, they're going to surprise Purdue with that element of surprise. So I was just so happy to see the UNT offense uh, generate more explosiveness, especially from the perimeter, and not have to rely on playing a 48 to 45 kind of game. And it would have been easy for them to get away from, from what they're good at and not take the shot clock down within 10 seconds. Because like we said, Purdue was a huge team. And, and the fact that we were able to still run our offense exactly how we wanted to throughout the course of that game was really impressive to me. Yeah, kudos to Grant McCaslin for just sticking to his game plan the whole night. I think we've discussed this many, many times on this show, but I think it, it deserves a shout out every single time. Just how good of a coach Grant McCaslin and Grant McCaslin is, how well respected he is by this school, by his team. You can just tell he's a leader of men. Jack, talk to me a little bit about that coach. Yeah, I just, I, you know, he's a great leader. He's turned this program into nothing, to something now on a national stage. People know who we are now. Uh, I just really hope McCaslin, we can keep him UNT for life because he's definitely going to gain interest from other, other teams just based on how good of a coach he is. It, is. it is definitely scary to think about the fact that he will probably receive offers. Hopefully we can keep him around. But we, so we've heard our reaction to this game. Uh, now we're gonna go over to Hank Dickinson, who is the voice of the Mean Green Sports Network. His, his resume is limitless, but uh, let's go and talk to Hank and see what he thinks of the game. Hank, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you. Uh, we're excited, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, if, get, if you guys don't know, Hank is the color commentator for Mean Green Sports Network, so he's got a game to call in a little bit. But Hank, I wanna ask you first, what does this win mean for not just the program, the athletics department, but the school as a whole? Well, I've always said that, that nothing really brands your university more than an upset in the, uh, in the first round of the NCAA tournament because all eyes are on you. Uh, I thought it was one of the biggest things in my 25 plus years of being uh, associated with UNT that's ever happened. You know, the, uh, the fake punt return against Arkansas a few years ago in football, created a, a really big buzz for the brand. Um, but when you win in the tournament, you get really three days of being in that news cycle and constant talk. And, and you know, it was one of those wins that wasn't a buzzer beater, it was a full effort. So and obviously we all know how, how good, good this team is and, and how well coached they are. And, you know, hopefully tonight you advance Yeah, hopefully we can get past Villanova. I know that, we'll, and we'll preview Villanova later in the show, but obviously we all know how good, how good JV and Hamlet is, and it's great to see him get that national recognition, but what about the other guys on the team? Because as we were discussing, it really was a full team effort. Well, I mean, a player who was waiting to break out, in my opinion, before the game was Thomas Bell, and he certainly did that. Uh, you know, we're still waiting for James Reese to kind of find that range from downtown. But the guy that you're looking at there a minute ago, Mardrez McBride, he has been unbelievable in the month of March. And it really started in Frisco, but he's playing well above his seasonal average. And the fact that you had pandemic starts and stops means he's really kind of coming into his own right about now, which makes sense for a guy that transferred in. So, you know, those wing shooters have been huge. Tonight, I think it's got to be all about Zach Simmons and the inside-outside attack. Take some pressure off Hamlet and let uh, let Simmons do what he can do in the low post, which includes really good passing to the wing. How much do you think of uh, a factor experience level was? Obviously, four of our, four of our starting five are seniors, and Murdras McBride is a junior. How big of a factor was that experience level? Well, I think that was huge against a, a really young Purdue team, really talented freshmen on that Purdue team, but still young people. And North Texas right now is the 24th most experienced team in all of college basketball. Simmons is the 30th most experienced player. And this is the 99th consecutive start tonight. So experience and the ability to be unflappable when things kind of go uh, the wrong way, is so important in keeping your focus. Now, I think we knew how good UNT was. Now, every, now it seems like everybody's catching on that uh, you know, we're, we're a real team. But I keep thinking about teams like Western Kentucky, Louisiana Tech, other teams in Conference USA that honestly I think could have gone to the tournament and won games. With, teams, with conferences like the Big Ten having big upsets in that first round, do you think that there's an argument to be made that CUSA deserved more bids in the tournament? 
I think it's really on the coaches in the league to schedule really good non-conference uh, opponents because that's what builds your net ranking, the old RPI. North Texas had uh, on Monday a top 64 net ranking. They, they belonged in this tournament. The other teams maybe didn't play the kind of uh, all-comer schedule that Grant McCaslin will play, and he's done it two years in a row. You forget last year some really rugged non-conference games. What happens if you're well-coached is you get better by playing the best, and then by the time you get to March, you're really not that worried about who you play because you know you can tee it up with anybody. I agree. That I really enjoyed watching that West Virginia game in the in the first half of the season, and that, and that coach's respect at the end of that game I thought really said a lot. But Justin, what did you have? Where would you rank this victory in terms of UNT sports moments all time? Uh, I would say it's top three, if not number one. Uh, for me, you know, we're in a football state, and there's been some some great football moments. Um, but this is the biggest stage. This is you're, you're playing for a national title when you make this tournament. So to advance in a national championship tournament for North Texas, something that hadn't happened, that win was the first win over a ranked team in 50 years. And now you've got a chance to do it twice in 72 hours. Only the NCAA tournament gives you that opportunity. And uh, again, I just would get back to the fact, think of the number of eyeballs that were on the mean green and how many people started to learn a little bit about the University of North Texas because of it. So I, I would have to say it's way, way up there. And there's a lot of argument to be said. It's one of the, the best nights in the history of athletics here. Jack? Hank, I was just going to ask, how long overdue is just this national or just, just attention from the media about UNT? Well, I think the, the thing you have to do, Jack, is when you get an opportunity, you have to deliver. So if it's if it's overdue, it's overdue because North Texas has kind of gotten to these plateaus before and then not had the opportunity to have, you know, heroic performance like J.B. on Hamlet. I mean, this guy has really North Texas on his shoulders, and he is embellishing what will be one of the great to add to that. Um, but I think, again, you know, this can happen for football. I think we were pretty close a few years ago to really having a magical season. But, you know, it's, it's to win, guys. It's really hard to win. And uh, a well-coached team gives you a chance. And the kind of defense we play in basketball, it gives you a chance each night. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned Marjorie McBride and, and kind of the performance that he's been having recently. What does it say about the time, you know, the time that, that, that he's stepped up in the biggest moment? You know, he's, he's the only returning starter next year. So what does that say about him, the fact that he's stepping up in the biggest moment? Well, I, again, I think he's playing with a level of confidence now that he hadn't probably had all year, and he's just building on it. He's scored 11 or more points in each of the last five, so he comes into this on a real roll. Now, you know, you're playing against one of the great coaches in the game in Jay Wright. He's going to find some ways to try to negate Hamlet and McBride. I think it's going to be really important that somebody else steps up tonight. And the two that I think have a chance to do that are Zach Simmons on the inside and James Reese on the wing. You know, James has been hitting tough shots all year, 75% on his mid-range. But if he can get loose and get some open looks from three, I really expect him to start knocking those shots down. We talked about brand earlier. What does a win like this do for the UNT basketball program? And where can it take them in the near future? especially with recruiting. Well, I re yeah, I remember back in the day when we finally punched through back in 2006, seven under Johnny Jones, we ended up landing really good recruits after that that would build you know, a, a really strong unit with Josh White, and Tristan Thompson, Georgia Dufa, but they got lured into North Texas based on their exposure to a, a trip to the NCAA tournament. I fully expect this coaching staff to really uh, clean up in recruiting and They've done a great job of finding some diamonds in the rough. Now I think they'll have a chance to go after three, four, five-star players. And you just you can't understate how important the immediacy is of this being fresh in the mind of high school kids. I remember last year when the 29-2010 when the Sunbelt Champs came back for that reunion. And I can't wait to be back here in 10 years for this team's reunion because I, th I really think this is a special team. But, Hank, we really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, come back and visit us soon. Awesome. And we will be back in just a few minutes. We're going to check out the bracket, let's talk about some upsets. Zach Fox has some upset news for us coming up.
Welcome back into Mean Green Game Day again. I'm your host, Sarah Baskin, alongside Jack, Justin, and Connor. Well, round one of the NCAA tournament is done, and we have seen nothing but upsets, including our very own North Texas over Purdue. So for, on a little bit more about the history of upsets in the tournament, let's go over to Zach Fox. Zach? Thanks, Sarah. Yep, upsets left and right after the first round matchups, but most importantly, 13 seed versus 4 seed, a.k.a. UNT. There were only two 13 seed versus 4 seed upsets, but hey, an upset's an upset. Now, let's go ahead and date back to the actual statistical side of things of a 13 seed upset. It happens a little more than you think. There were 31 13 seed upsets since 1985 against 4 seeds since the tournament expanded in 1985. Now, there are 21 14 seed teams that will beat the three seed teams. That's only happened 21 times. The all time record between that is 21 wins and 119 losses. That puts the win percentage to 15%. Remember, I said there's 31 teams where the 13 seed beat the four seed. I know those little numbers at you, but that means that it's 5.71% more chance, more likely, that the 13 seed will upset the four seed. And obviously, we saw that happen in, on full display. Now, one of the most memorable games in NCAA AA uh, history in March Madness tournament is none other than a 13 seed taking out a four seed. Take a look at this. Ole Miss losing to Valparaiso back in 1998 with two and a half seconds left in the game with a two point deficit. The Crusaders had one final shot to tie or win. Bryce Drew's desperation 23 foot three pointer to move on to the next round. That run is actually ranked number three all time uh, in Cinderella's stories and is now looked at as the shot and for good reason. Now in 28 of the last 35 seasons, there have been a total of 10, between 10 and 16 upsets in a March Madness tournament. Now that's pretty high and it, the actual the annual average is actually 12.2 upsets. Now that's upsets not just a 16 seed taking out a one seed, not anything like that, but it can be as little as an eight and nine seed. Just upsets period, 10 and 16. However, that, can, that number actually drops to as low as four back in 2007 and can rise to as high as 19 as we saw in 2014. And despite not having a March Madness tournament last year, we've obviously seen a lot more upsets as of late and that's happening on full display once again. Obviously, after the first round, North Texas, one of the top teams to move on. You have ACU taking out Texas last night thanks to two clutch free throws. Oral Roberts University taking out a number two Ohio State. And then finally, Ohio taking out the defending champ. So my question to you is, which team is more, uh, basically, what, which team has more to prove? Would it be the number five Villanova team? Remember UNT taking on a four seed last, uh, just a couple days ago, now taking on a five. But who has more to prove, Villanova? Your March Madness as of late has been great to higher seed teams, so do they have more to prove to take out the high seed team? Or is it like the usual side of things? And hey, UNT just made history just by simply going to the second round. Do they have more to prove? Well, I guess that answer, that answer will be uh, answered tonight, but uh, we'll see how the Mean Green fare against the number five Villanova. Thanks, Zach. Listen, I, to answer your question, I think that Villanova has more to prove. You know, they were going into the tournament. They were a, a team that all of us talked about uh, in our bracket challenge of whether or not we wanted to pick Winthrop over Villanova. And that was talked about a lot in the national media that Winthrop could very easily upset them. They're missing some guys. But we'll get into previewing that matchup later on in the show. Let's talk about ACU over Texas. Jack, give me your gut reaction to that one. Just really shocking how ACU ended up winning after shooting less than 30% 30, 30 from the field and shooting terrible from the three-point line. It just shows how ACU's defense is just amazing. And so, and their coach has really good dance moves. Connor, I want you to talk to me a little bit about Texas in the NCAA tournament. What's the deal? That upset completely shocked me. I mean, when you looked at Texas region and the way they've been playing recently, to me that, that just lined up perfectly for at least an Elite Eight uh, possible matchup against Alabama. But uh, to, Abilene Christian played out of their minds, especially defensively. This was a ACU team that had been really good on defense all season. They, they kind of remind me of Texas Tech, the way they play on defense. Uh, but it kind of shocked me with how bad, especially the Texas offense played, as good as their defense would play. If you, if you had told me pregame that ACU would score 53 points, I would have said, okay, Texas wins by about 20 because their average is right about 75 points per game. But they had a season high in turnovers. They had half as many turnovers 
as they did points, just about. So it was a sloppy, sloppy performance from the Longhorns, and uh, one that they are going to feel for a long time. They, they had over 20 turnovers, turnovers, and in fact, the game ended on a turnover at the, on that last second yeah. lob. It kind of rem reminded me of that old Miss game that, that Zach showed us, but it didn't end the way that they wanted it to. Justin, talk to me about the game. Well, from a Texas perspective, I can't say I was surprised. Now, I said this on the show before the, the last UNT game. Texas is one of those teams that is solid on both sides of the ball, but they don't have a specific skill set that they excel at. So when things go south in games, like it did against ACU, they don't really have a skill that they can you know, go back on. You know, they're not great from, from the three-point range, so, so whenever they're, they're down in games, that's not what they can revert to. So this is kind of what happened against ACU. They probably weren't expected to, to be in a close game here, and they were, so I think it just kind of caught them off guard. And it really sucks for Texas because they have Andrew Jones and they have uh, the big man that's going to be in, in the number one pick in the NBA draft, Greg Brown. It's just that's the best team I think they're going to have maybe for a while, so it, it just sucks to lose like that. You know, I, I, I'm admittedly a big Longhorn fan. Connor knows that from, you know, years of doing these shows with me. But I couldn't help but, you know, root for ACU in those final moments. It, they reminded me of us, you know, in a, in, a, in a moment where they had clearly dominated the game, clearly, uh, you know, deserved to win that game and ended up winning it uh, in the end. But the other huge upset of the first round was Oral Roberts over Ohio State. Jack, what was your reaction to that one? It's just mind-boggling. I was I was up in the studio at K2 across from NTTV watching the game, and I just it it I just I was like it's March, and so I'm just happy March Madness is back. But Ohio State, I had them going to at least the lead Elite Eight, so I just didn't see it coming. We're gonna definitely take a look at our brackets in the next block. Uh, see just how busted Jax is from that pick. But Connor, what did you think? Well, I'm in the same boat as Jack. I, I'm shocked, quite frankly. A, a 15 over two, including that game has only happened nine times. So, I mean, it's not something you would go out and expect. I remember uh, Joe Lenardi actually had Oral Roberts in that game. And I remember thinking, really? Well, I guess we're going to find out. Hey, it's March Madness, just like Jack said, and I'm grateful to have it back. So I, I, I'm just kind of like, you know what? Let's just have at it. Let's enjoy the tournament. And, and I know that these college basketball players uh, really enjoy being back, and obviously they want to win, but it's just great after what last year brought to us. It's just great to have college basketball brought for the American public. Now, something else I want to talk about, about that game. Af the day after, 24 hours later, about uh, one of the better players for Ohio State was having death threats sent to him. Now, this is just not cool. If, if you want to blame yourself for making a pick, for not picking Oral Roberts in that game, you can blame yourself for not having the perfect bracket. But don't go out and blame someone else who's fighting a lot more adversity than you are and is working their butt off on and off the court in the classroom, that's not cool and that needs to stop. I agree. I think it can be easy to think of, uh, you know, not think of athletes, particularly student athletes, as people and students. I think it's complete. I agree, agree with you totally, Connor. I thought it was totally inappropriate, the reaction that they were getting. But uh, I do want to talk about a couple other Texas teams. In that first round, every single Texas team, except for Texas and Texas Southern, but they won their first four matchup, every Texas team won. We thought Houston was a pretender. Baylor came out. Justin, talk to me about those Texas teams. Well, I think Baylor lo looks like the clear-cut national champion right now in my book. I mean, they've just perfected that small ball lineup. They can meet you in so many different ways. I just I love what Baylor still brings to the table. And you mentioned Houston. I still think they're, pre they're a pretender. You know, I, I know Connor in his bracket has them losing to Rutgers in, in, in the next round. They, they play some tough teams here down the stretch of the season, er, down the stretch of the tournament. And if they keep advancing, you know, that's going to surprise me because they haven't seen these big levels of competition all season long. So I still think Houston's a pretender. I don't know if they're. I don't know if I agree with you fully that they're a pretender. I think they're definitely a team to watch. I can't remember exactly how far I had them going, but I don't think it was totally far. But we can't let you. We can't end this block without talking about Gonzaga and that ridiculously dominating win um, last night. Jack, Jack, talk to me about that one. Yeah, it just it just goes to show that like it like Justin said, Baylor. It just shows that they just took care of business and they're on to the next round. So it just shows that I think Gonzaga and Baylor are just the top two teams and anybody else is not even close. So it just shows Gonzaga's what they are. What do you guys think was the best, was the best matchup of the first round? Other than UNT Purdue, obviously. 
How about Villanova Winthrop? I mean, that was an interesting game. Not, not, not only because you know we're playing the winner, but that was an interesting one because, like you said, a lot of people had picked Winthrop uh, coming into that game. They were a streaky offense and a, and a pretty efficient defense, and, and Villanova pretty much did just whatever they wanted to them. But I thought that was an interesting game in the first round, and it was closer than I think the score indicated. I think the first game, uh, Virginia Tech versus Florida, that first game of March Madness this year, went to overtime, hit a three to, to send it to overtime. It was super exciting. It was like the first game, so it was fun. But UCSB and Creighton. I mean, UCSB was literally that close at going to the next round. If that guy makes a little floater there at the end, the, it, there's about one second left. And as you saw with Texas last night, you can't really do much with one second left on the clock. But it, was, it literally went halfway down and it came out. So it's a classic 5-12 game, classic March Madness game that had uh, multiple runs where teams would go on 6-9-0 runs, making threes. A team would be up by 10. The next thing you know, it'd be a two-point game. Classic March Madness. I could not agree more. Listen, I'm just happy that March Madness is back. And with March Madness comes bracket stress. A lot of our brackets are busted. We're going to take a look and see how well we're doing right after the break. Welcome back to Mean Green Game Day. I'm your host, Sarah Baskin, alongside Jack, Connor, and Justin. Fellas, I know a lot of us picked Ohio State. I know a lot of us picked Texas. A lot of our brackets are busted. Justin, where do you stand right now? Well, I am completely busted. And the first place that I went wrong was with San Diego State. Now, I really like this team coming into March Madness because I thought they were playing some of their best basketball of the season right at the tail end. I think they had won 18 out of their last 19 games or some crazy stat like that. They were, they were red hot. 
And I think the problem was they just ran into a Syracuse team that was a little bit red hotter. And Syrac you got to credit Syracuse defense because that was one of the best showings I've ever seen from a defense. They held San Diego State to 36% from the field and 28% from the three-point line, which is both way lower than, than San Diego State has been all season long. Now, the second place that I went wrong is with Ohio State, and I think we're all going to have that one. Now, Ohio State has, is known for playing down to their competition, but I didn't think that it was, that it was going to be this bad, and especially not in the first round. I thought, in fact, the BRAC was actually favorable to the Buckeyes to get to the Elite Eight, but as we see, it didn't turn, turn out that way at all. Now, I was, I was right about Oregon State beating Tennessee uh, in, on the show because Tennessee was playing a lot of up and down basketball all season in the SEC. And really the question going into that game was which Tennessee team was going to show up. And it turned out to be the one that couldn't beat Oregon State. Now, Oregon State was, was, a, was a team that really heated up in the Pac-12 tournament. So that was a common upset pick over a, 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 an up and down volunteer team. So I, I did luck out and get that one correct in the 12-5 matchups. Now, I was also right about Ohio over Virginia. We talked about Virginia a little bit before. They had a lot of question marks coming into, coming into the tournament, and I thought Ohio was a really dangerous team. They're a team that live and die by the three ball, and they, they had it going in this game, and Jason Preston went off for them, and that was an awesome showing as well. That was one of the only upsets that actually happened that, that, were, that was predicted on a national level uh, consistently. Also, Florida State almost completely busted by my Final Four uh, when they almost lost to UNT Greensboro. That's, that's one of the ones that I kind of went out on a limb on, was picking them to the Final Four. But I still like their, their trio and their backboard. They have a lot of different ways they can beat you. It was, it was worrisome to see them struggling against UNC Greensboro. But you know I kind of hoped that, that maybe they were just looking over their, their first round opponent and that they'll turn it up here. But San Diego State and Ohio State were really the two ones that completely busted my bracket. Okay, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about that pick of Illinois. You had them going to your to your championship round, and they lost to Loyola yeah. Chicago earlier today. What it, what happened there? Well, I think we all underestimated the Loyola Chicago defense. Now they're they're leading the nation in scoring defense uh, on a per game basis, and and we thought that was maybe just due to the fact that their conference is a little bit weaker. But that turned out to not be the case at all. Their defense really flies around. Uh, and, and they play variations of zone and man, and it gave Illinois a lot of trouble. They shut down Iota Sumnu today, and that was that was the biggest key to stopping the Illini. They were doubly, double teaming him. They stole the ball from him a lot. They were just making it a nightmare for him. Now, Connor, I know a lot of us really liked Illinois going in, but uh, we also really liked Loyola Chicago, and I forget who your pick was. Who did you pick for that game? I picked Georgia Tech to beat Loyola in the first round, so I didn't even have Loyola <laughs> make it to the next round. So busted. <laughs> Uh, well, busted to a degree, but with Illinois more so than than Loyola. Uh, I've been, I've have, I have a lot more red than I do green right now with my bracket, uh, specifically with the Texas Longhorns. I just, again, like I said uh, a, a couple minutes ago, I'm just shocked that Texas lost that game. I had them going to the Final Four, so yeah, my bracket has been busted, and it was even kind of bra uh, busted before then with Ohio State, but. We, we were kind of all offset with that loss, essentially, because everybody lost that game. So everyone's bracket has been busted, especially today with Illinois losing, and then West Virginia just lost to Syracuse about 30 minutes ago. So everybody's bracket's been busted. Here is something to keep an eye out. I want to talk a little bit about with the games that I've won, and here's where I could potentially make a run, uh, especially in the pool that I'm in right now. If LSU tomorrow beats Michigan, and we do see that 8 seed beat a 1 seed. We saw it today with Loyola. We could see it tomorrow with LSU. LSU is playing their best basketball of the season. Michigan is playing their worst basketball of the season. Justin brought up earlier about that Oregon State-Tennessee matchup. This is a similar matchup, except on a higher degree. So LSU is a possible upset watch. If LSU happens to win that game, that could help my bracket a lot. Florida State is another team that I have going very far. I have them going to the Elite Eight. And then, of course, I had Texas beating them. But obviously... Again, my bracket has been busted, for, especially for that region. Now, moving forward, here's something if you're into the, all the, the money and the betting and you're picking them on ESPN, you get 320 points, uh, 320 points per round. Divide that by the amount of games, that's how many points you get per win. That means if you had the champion correct, you earn 320 points with the championship alone. So right now I have Baylor winning the national championship. So as long as my bracket doesn't continue to get busted with the other regions and games, I have a chance to win it all. And you mentioned, listen, you mentioned that pool that all of us are in, and it's, it's worth noting that the number one guy in our pool did pick Illinois, so his max score went down by 1,000 today. So all of us in this room have a chance in that pool. But, Jack, did you, uh, did you pick North Texas to win? 
Uh, I don't think I did. Yeah, Aww. I didn't pick North Texas to win. I guess I had no faith in them. But hey, I mean, Connor, your your bracket's going to be even more busted when they beat Baylor. So in the Sweet 16. So oh, no, I'm just kidding. But but yeah, the, my bracket it it started out really bad. I mean, Florida, Virginia Tech. I picked the first game wrong. So I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with March Madness. I'm rude. Like, I don't even care if, like, the underdogs win. Like, I'm – it's cool. So, like, Loyola, they're a good team. They, they beat Illinois. I don't know how. I don't think they have enough offensive firepower to beat Illinois, but their defense really showed. And so, I'm done with March Madness, but I'm just here for North Texas. If you and T-Bus my bracket like they already kind of have, then I will be fine. Th that's the only way I'm going to be okay. And that's the only way I'm going to, be, to accept a Baylor loss in the tournament is that they lose to UNT. That's it. Because I'm either pulling for Baylor to win the national championship or for UNT to make some kind of histor historical great run. It's also worth noting that Connor Hibbett is the only one in this room that picked UNT to win the CUSA tournament. So we should really listen to his word right now because he was the only one that nailed it. But you mentioned a potential UNT-Baylor matchup. I personally had UNT going to the Sweet 16 round and meeting up with Baylor. And that was sort of where I had them ending. Um, how good are our chances against Baylor looking ahead, uh, you know, kind of past Villanova? How good are our chances if we made it there? Well, first, I just want to say not, not even about the game. If we get to that point and if we beat Baylor, I'm climbing up a light pole at UNT. And I hope it's like at Tech when they, they went to the Final Four that one year. The, the campus is crowded. It's a big party. So I, I hope we beat Baylor for those reasons. But I'm sure Connor has a, uh, and Justin have a better idea on that. Well, I think to beat Baylor, you would have to probably have your best offensive game that you've ever had. You know, I, d I don't think you can get in a low scoring game with Baylor because it just doesn't happen with them. They have too many good scores. So I think, you know, it would probably be a higher scoring game and I would just have to favor Baylor, you know, in higher scoring games. You know, UNT is usually the more defensive team and, and playing lower scoring games. So this one, I, this one would be really, really, really tough. The one thing I'll say about UNT, and Justin brought this up when we were watching against Purdue, they are disciplined and they never fold. No matter what the score is, no matter what time of the game is, they still play UNT basketball. So I know regardless of what the score is against, if we happen to beat Villanova, play against Baylor in the Sweet 16, I don't care what the score is at any point in that game, we are going to continue to play UNT basketball. We won't get rattled. Here's the problem when I see it in that matchup. We lost to UAB a couple weeks ago. UAB is a small ball team. Baylor is another small ball team that plays with a lot of multiple guards and they can play elite offensively and defensively. So that the way we match up does scare me a little bit. You know, I'm going to actually disagree with you, but agree with you at the same time. I think that it was important for us to lose those two games against UAB. I think that was really a wake up call for us. Um, not that we were asleep at all as a team, but you know, I really think that it showed them how bad they wanted it, uh, the holes in their game and what they needed to clean up. And they went into that tournament just completely laser focused. And I love what you said about how they just never quit. You know, Javion Hamlet was quoted in a lot of interviews after that win to Purdue about how gritty they were and how that's what they want to be known for is being that gritty team. But of all of the upsets from the first round, UNT included, does UNT have the best chance to move forward to the Sweet 16 round or who is that team? I think it's UNT. I mean, I think you're, you're catching a Villanova team that we're going to preview here in a little bit, but they're missing one of their best players. And I don't think a lot of the Cinderella's across the board that are still remaining could say that. So, you know, you're going against a team that's, that's going to be questioning some things on both sides of the ball without their best player. So I think, I think that's a good pick, uh, having UNT the most likely to go, go farther. Yeah, and I, and I totally agree. And this, this is what Justin said uh, a couple shows ago. It's our defense, it's good enough to beat anybody. And if we have that offense we did against Purdue, I think we can take anybody, so it's it's just about consistency. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to go kind of go go back to what Hank was saying earlier in the show about how we really need Zach Simmons to have an offensive game. You know, we I think all of us uh, were really, you know, that was our biggest worry going into Purdue uh, with Zach Eady because he's just so big. But Zach Zach him and Zach Simmons absolutely held his own against him. But I agree, we do need him to have like a really good offensive game uh, moving forward. Connor, is UNT the best? the best upset to go forward. Definitely so. I mean, a lot of us had Winthrop beating Villanova. And if we have Winthrop winning that game, I'm sure we're, we're, we're going to have the same thoughts about UNT pulling off that upset. And when I look at Villanova, of course, we should probably say this more for the next block, but when I look at Villanova, they have a lot of uh, issues with their team right now, specifically their guard play, and that's where UNT could thrive against them. We are definitely going to preview that Villanova game coming up next after the break. We're going to talk about key players, 
what we think it'll take to win, and then we'll make our final pick for if we, were, if we can actually win that game. Stick around. And I know I speak for these three guys when I say it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be UNT students at this time in history. We cannot wait for this Villanova game later this evening. Before we get into previewing this game, I want to talk a little bit about Villanova Winthrop because like I mentioned earlier, you know, they were really, a, that was a matchup that a lot of us were unsure about. Some of us picked Winthrop to move forward. What, what really happened in that game, Jack? Uh, it just started with uh, the three ball. I think they shot 30% from three and that Villanova does a lot better than that. So I think Winthrop did, really did a, a good job handling Villanova's three-point shot. And then another stat was that they had eight blocks and a team that has 40 blocks over the whole regular season. So, and Thomas Bell has 32, uh, that's a little sneak peek. But so it's like, they, they're not the best at uh, defending in the paint, but they did a good job against Winthrop. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's evident, first of all, that they're still kind of trying to figure, figure things out without Colin Gillespie. He was their leader on and off the floor, and he's pretty much our JV and Hamlet. He's their do-it-all guy, and he's the guy that their offense starts with. So it was evident at some points where they just seemed confused and maybe lost without him. But the thing that they did really well in this game was, that, was they played from in front. So it kind of allowed them to, to figure out the offensive game as they went along. Uh, throughout the course of this game. And, and I mentioned Win Winthrop being a streaky team. Villanova held them to 36% from the field uh, overall in this game, which was, which was really impressive from them. And then Villanova countered with a very balanced attack on offense. Jeremiah Robinson Earl led the way. He had a double-double, 22 points. He, he's going to be the big man that we're going to have to go against. He's kind of like their Travian Williams. You know, Thomas Bell is going to have his work cut out for him. He's a 6'9 guy, similar to Travian Williams, 6'10 last week. So, you know, that's going to be one of the matchups here that I'm looking for. And they, they had four, four starters and double digits in that game, along with 15 bench points. So Vil, the Villanova offense is really about balance and efficiency, much like UNT's is going to have to be to win this game. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a couple key players uh, for, for this game moving forward. Who do you think is going to be the most important piece for UNT? I think it's going to be Thomas Bell. Their leading scorer is Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Uh, pretty much all of his points come from inside the paint. It kind of reminds me of Travian Williams for Purdue in, in a lot of ways. He's primarily a post player. You know, he's going to spend all of his time in the post, and he's a physical rebounder. So Thomas Bell, you know, once again, our best defensive player is going to be going against their best offensive player. And a, and a guard that I'm looking for, for for Villanova to maybe have a big game is Justin Moore. He's he's going to have to handle a lot of the weight now without Colin Gillespie in, and he's been doing a really nice job so far of picking up some of the weight as scoring-wise without Gillespie. Now you mentioned Thomas Bell. I 
I, I want to give credit to Jack because Jack had, Jack was talking about Thomas Bell, uh, you know, a few weeks ago and how how important he is to this team and what a dream he is to have on the team. Jack, you want to follow that up with anything? Yeah, I just I just think him being able to shoot a three ball and his defense is just he's so efficient and it's just something that you have to have. And I'm pretty sure every college would would want him want them on their team. But to pull up my uh, key player, I think McBride. McBride's got to get you those three balls tonight, at least two or three. So I think if you have McBride on, I think it's you know, good, a good chance of UNT pulling this one out. And I, I like that because this is a totally different offense when McBride and when James Reese are on their game. Because when Javion Hamlet drives the lane, if those guys aren't, are, aren't on fire, the guards can just focus in on Javion Hamlet. So when these guys are firing well from the outside, it totally opens up everything else that this offense uh, has in store. So that, that's an important player, uh, Dres McBride, coming into this game for sure. What do you think, Connor? Well, kind of like what Hank said, I'm looking for Zachary Simmons to have a pretty big game. I'm going to say I'm going to anticipate Villanova to anticipate to come out and, and make sure that the guards don't beat you for UNT. So I'm looking at around the, the lower post for us to have a big game. And I don't know why, but I've got this feeling that Zach Simmons is just going to go off tonight. I've just got this feeling he's the most ex experienced player on our roster. I, I just got this feeling he's scoring in the double digits and he's going to be the player of the game. I'm writing it down right now, Connor. Zach Simmons, player of the game. We will remember it if it's accurate, and we will give you full credit. But, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about JV and Hamlet a little bit. What does JV and Hamlet need to do to carry this team to a win? How about shoot some more floaters? He's, he's, he's first in the country. We saw that statistic. He makes, like, in the high 80s or low 90s of floaters. That's, that's insane. And what we see today, it feels like today's basketball is either a three-pointer or a layup or dunk. There's no in-between game. That's what separates Javon Hamlet from most guards, uh, college or in the NBA. He has that mid-range game, and that's what really frustrates a defense because if you play man against him, he can come around you, get a layup. If you play zone against him, he's going to attack the middle of the floor and shoot that 10, 12, 15-foot mid-range mid jump shot. So I like what Hamlet brings, and I like what UNT has done the last couple of games utilizing their guard play. You know, uh, my real gut reaction player uh, player to watch for this game is going to be James Reese. Um, you know, just watching these these tournament games, watching him line up for a three point shot, you you just have this gut feeling like you know he's going to make it almost all of the time. Um, we really need to see that from him coming moving forward for tonight. Um, I'm really going to agree with what Hank said about uh, about that one. But Justin, we talked about UNT players to the game. We talked about some key players. You brought up a couple Villanova players. Talk to me about Colin Gillespie. How big of a hole is that in this Villanova team? Well, like I said, he's basically their, their JV and Hamlet. You know, every, everything they did on offense pretty much this season started with him. And if you look at the stats, their offense was so much more better, or so much better uh, po points wise with Gillespie in the lineup than without him. He's just, he's their heart and soul, and, and losing him is, is, is really hard to, to go and play, play without him in the tournament. Yeah, and him being a senior, you know how seniors affect us at UNT. He, he is Mr. Villanova, so it, it just really sucks for him not to be able to play. Yeah. Who else are you guys' uh, Villanova players to watch? I know you re mentioned Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Yeah, he, he's going to be going against Thomas Bell. You know, he's a 6'9 guy, kind of like Travian Williams, very physical in the paint. So Thomas Bell is going to be going to have his work cut out for him going against him. Yeah, what about Justin Moore? Well, like I said, he's going to have a ton of the weight put on him uh, without Colin Gillespie. It's how it's been over the past few games, but he's, he's been scoring double digit points. He's been high in assist. I think he leads the team in assist behind Colin Gillespie. So, I mean, he's gonna have a lot, a lot more of the weight on him and we're just kind of waiting to see how he plays against an elite defense now with, with an increased role. Yeah, and I, I really like this matchup between Villanova and UNT. I think we, they, they're, they're both just slow paced teams and they both fit each other very well. So I think it's just gonna be just a, bogged down defensive game. Yeah, you're exactly right about that. And there's a lot of similarities between Purdue and Villanova for me. And, and when you watch them play, it just seems like Purdue maybe has the bigger big men while Villanova has the better guard play around them. And, and like Jack said, it's going to be a slow paced game. Villanova is 331st in pace and we're, we're 350th out of 357 D1 teams. So this is going to be a, a, low, a, a low paced and low scoring game once again. Uh, in, the, in this game against Villanova because they're low pace. They focus on defense just like we do. I think we match up very well with them. On and off the court, there are similarities with the coaches, more importantly. Grant McCaslin and Jay Wright are two of the best coaches in college basketball. And these two coaches perhaps are some of the better program builders right now in the NCAA. So I think this is going to be a terrific matchup on and off the court.
I completely agree, but I, what do you guys think are really the keys? Like, what is it going to take for UNT to win this game? So I think with Villanova, like I said a little bit earlier, during the regular season, they only had 40 blocks. Thomas Bell by himself has 32. So I think with uh, Purdue, they have the big man. We had to really focus on the three ball and make that, but now the paint's going to be open, no rim protection. I think we're going to see Zach Simmons score and, and Hamlet get to the rim easy. So it's going to be more of an open, open paint for us this game. How about sticking to your identity as a key? Connor mentioned it. No matter what Purdue threw at us, we were going to still play that slow-paced offense and still do what UNT does best, uh, no matter what the score is of this game. And even if we fall behind against Villanova, we're still going to go slow-paced because that's just our style of offense. So I want to see us just sticking to this identity no matter what the score is of this game because I think we'll have success, especially on the defensive side. If we're defensive-minded first and we shut that down, then it's going to open up a lot of things for us to do on the offensive side, kind of like it did against Purdue. How well, how much do you guys think that you know championship, excuse me, tournament experience really plays into this? Because Villanova is one of the most experienced teams in this tournament. Connor, what do you think? Well, you look at Villanova, what they've done the last few years. Of course, not last year, but two years ago, they got upset by Purdue. But the year before that, they won the national championship. And again, I'm going to say this again. I'm afraid of Jay Wright, their head coach. He's one of the best coaches in the country. But I think we have one of the best coaches in the country. So you look at the experience for this specific season, and I look at UNT and their experience versus Villanova and theirs, we had the advantage in that. You heard Hank bring it up. We're one of the few most experienced teams in the country. We knew that coming into this year. We know what we are capable of. We were built for this stage of college basketball, and I think we can pull it off. You guys have a final score? Okay, I'll go 65-63, UNT. I was going to say something like that. 70-65, UNT. I think we match up fine with them. I'll go 67-66, UNT. I don't know Nailed what Jack. Me. I don't know what Jack's. What's inside Jack's brain and why it's the exact same as mine. But it, I was going to say the same thing. 67-66. I think this is going to be a close game, guys. I don't know about you. I cannot handle another overtime. You know, like I can't as handle a, a one-point game. I, I can't do it again. <laughs> like you just is, said. Is this what it feels like when you a team you root for is actually good? Because I've never really experienced this living in Dallas, so. No, I've never, I've never experienced it. Never experienced it either. But what else is it going to take to win this game, you guys think? And what happens moving forward? Well, I think another key to the game is you're going to have to win your one-on-one -on -one matchups. I talked about how we double-teamed Travian, Travian Williams last week. It's not going to really be able to be that way uh, against Jeremiah Robinson Earl because, like I said, Villanova has a ton of different guys that can beat you on the outside, whereas Purdue really didn't have elite guard play. So it's going to be solo efforts pretty much across the board on defense. So if you win your one-on-one -on -one -on -one matchups, you'll get the team win. I think momentum is a real thing, and it's going to – UNT is hot right now, so I think it's going to carry out that way. And momentum is such a big deal. Jack, you know I'm 100% with you on momentum. We talk about that a lot off air, how much, you know, how much momentum and experience really matters moving forward. What do you think, Connor? Basketball is a game of runs. We've seen it all tournament long. When you're confident your team just hit a few shots in a row, here comes the other team. They'll make a couple shots, force a turnover, next thing you know it, the momentum is switched. And like you said, Jack, momentum. And momentum is key in every sport, but in basketball, it just seems to be a more fluid situation. I just want to say, as a UNT student, this is an unbelievable thing for me, an experience. I, if I had to repeat my life 10, 12, 15 more times, it would never happen again. This exact story would never happen again. The fact that I'm getting to experience this at a college like a UNT versus, you know, uh, it's different if you're going to North Carolina Duke where you expect to make uh, the championship run every single season. But this is such a surreal moment for me as a student. I am just so glad that I get to be on air talking about UNT and March Madness. This is terrific. And I would, I would even take that a step further. I, I don't think it could have been, it couldn't have happened in a better year. You know, 2021, this has been a crazy year. And I think, you know, this, this team's success has really given us, given us something to watch and, and some hope in, in, some, in some weird times. So I, 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 I would say that this year, you know, in particular, has, has made this experience even so much better for the Mean Green. I completely agree. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm actually a graduate student now, and I just feel lucky that, you know, to still be around here experiencing it and to really be experience it, experiencing it with you guys. You know, we've been, we've been talking a lot about UNC basketball all year. It's been an absolute amazing ride just, you know, watching them. And, uh, you know, we just want to wish them, the, you know, the best luck moving forward, and uh, hopefully they pull out a win tonight. We can't wait to see, but we just want to thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's show. Hopefully we'll see you again one more time, at least one more time this season. But until then, uh, you can find us on Twitter at, at MGGameDay or on YouTube at NTTV Sports. See you next time.